Nikki has children's church this morning, so I was telling her this morning, I, listen, years ago I used to tell her what I was going to preach. And probably about 15, 20 years ago, Nikki said, just tell me when you tell everybody else. And so, so uh, but this morning I did tell her, I said, listen, I've got a lot of text I'm going to try to cover this morning. She goes, well, do you have to read all the text? I said, I, I kind of do. And she was like, you need to shorten it up. I said, well, you got children's church. And I said, you get to watch this later. And I, she looked at me like she might watch it later. So I'm hoping she does. Anyhow, I'm picking on her while she's downstairs. First Samuel chapter 8. And no kidding, we will cover a fair amount of text today. And so we'll, we'll try to cover some area, cover some ground that uh, could normally take us a few weeks. And so we're going to see if we can do that today. First Samuel chapter 8. A little bit of background. Last time we discussed Samuel being called by God and how um, we left off with him sharing God's message with Eli and this was a message of judgment that went out to Eli and his sons. You remember Eli, the high priest, his sons were wicked, and Eli didn't do anything about their bad behavior, and God was bringing judgment down upon Eli's household. Eli had raised Samuel. Remember Hannah gave him over, gave Samuel over to Eli for him to raise, and, and um, Eli had not done a great job of raising his own sons, but Samuel was being raised up in and around the tabernacle. Um, we also found last week that Scripture said that Samuel, the child Samuel, grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and with men. Uh, we also read that as Samuel grew that the Lord was with him. And I love what it said. It said that none of the words spoken by Samuel, none of those words fell to the ground. And uh, back in the day, that was what would prove if someone was a true prophet of God, if what they prophesied actually came to pass and the words didn't fall to the ground. And so... We found that last week as well. We also saw that Samuel had grown in his popularity and his, in his respect across the land from, uh, from the territory of Dan all the way to Beersheba. And uh, now today we fast forward many years. Samuel has been serving the Lord faithfully. Um, he had subdued the Philistines a handful of times and had uh, really served the Lord faithfully to, to do all that God wanted him to do. Certainly Samuel had been established as a prophet. He had... He was now a judge, and he had judged the land wisely. And uh, However, the people, though, were growing unsatisfied with the leadership structure that they were witnessing. They were tired of having someone be a judge like Samuel. They were really wanting to have a king like other nations is what they were secretly wanting. And today we'll see how they publicly shared this with Samuel. And so they were discontent with leadership is what we find here. And so, number one, the people demanded a king. So, 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you're there, say amen. amen. Beginning at verse number 1. Now, it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And there were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now, here it is we find the people demanded a king. And if you and I were just to read this and not really think closely or look closely at what was said here, we could read this and just conclude that, that Samuel, listen, your, your sons are, are, are horrible. You're getting old, and your sons aren't doing a good job either. And uh, we need a king. We could read this and find that that may be the primary reason, but there was more to it than that. In fact, this group of elders that gather at Ramah, which is a, some hill country about five miles north of Jerusalem, they decide that they have three reasons they want a new king or they want a king. Remember, they've not had a king, but now they want a king. Uh, Samuel, they said, first of all, they said, you're old. I don't know who likes to hear that. Does anybody ever like to hear that you're old? Amen. I, I don't know if we like to hear that. I'm 54 now. I'm beginning to hear that. Tammy, I'm hearing people say, hey, Jason, you're getting old. I'm like, I don't want to hear that from people. But, yeah, Kevin says, you are old. Well, they said, Samuel, you're, you're old. You're old is what they said. That's reason number one. 
Reason number two, hey, Samuel, your sons, hey, listen, they don't walk in your ways. Now, listen, Samuel, we, we like what you did, but your sons, they don't do any of that. They don't walk the way you walked. And so that's what they say. Yeah, you're getting old, but then your sons, they don't walk in your ways was reason number two. Reason number three is we want to be like all the other nations around us, and we want to have our own king like all of these nations around us. And by the way, all the nations around them were wicked. <laughs> And horrible and the kings around them were wicked and horrible but they're like we want a king like everybody else that's around us um, and so that's what they say um, and here's the thing when you look at this and one of the things that I think that God really put on my heart was that you know what as people we have always somehow been tempted to want to be like everybody else you ever notice that we're tempted to want to be like everybody else here it is, God's people, uh, they come to Samuel and they want to be like everybody else. They want to have a king like everybody else. These nations that we don't like around us, listen, we want to at least be like them in that they have a king. We want to be like everybody else is what they were saying. We want to be perhaps with whatever's popular, whatever's trendy. We want to do whatever is being done by, by these other nations. Listen, they could care less that they're the people of God and these other people weren't. And the people of God, as we all know, should... Walk different than everybody else, agreed? But I'll tell you this, even in our Christian walk, sometimes we want to be like everybody else if we're not careful. If we're not careful, we want to operate just like everybody else. Today, listen, that is so popular among the young people that, that you know what, we, do we need to fit in, Brother Jason. We can be Christians and we can fit in and be like everybody else. No, you can't. You're not supposed to. Yes, you can be a Christian, but you are not to fit in and just... Listen, fall into this culture and look like everybody else and make decisions like everybody else and walk the ways of this world like everybody else. God has a different plan for you, and he had a different plan for God's people back here. But listen, the people wanted to be like everybody else. Some of the things that were spoken of by the people to Samuel over time, here's a few things that I found as I looked in God's word. One of the things they would say is, we're tired of worshiping an invisible God, Samuel. We're tired of worshiping an invisible God. Everyone else has a king that they bow down to that they can visibly, visibly see. We don't want an invisible God that we cannot see. We want a visible God that we can see. Um, Samuel, we're tired of explaining that we don't have an earthly king, that our king's in heaven. When uh, some other nation, we run into somebody we know at Walmart, and they say, well, who's your God? Well, my God's invisible, and, uh, and he's in heaven. I, we're tired of explaining that our God, our king is in heaven. Samuel, we don't want to have to say that anymore. It would be really good, Samuel, if we could say, you know what? Our king is right over here. You can see him. He's very popular, and he's nice. He's very charismatic, and you'll like him. No, no, we're tired of saying that our king's in heaven is what they would say. To Samuel, that's what's been said in the public. They were saying to Samuel, we want a leader on earth, here. We want to be like other nations. Uh, we want to be like the, the Philistines and the Moabites and the Jebusites and all the other termites and the ites that were down the road. We want to be like everybody else. We know they're wicked, but we want to be like them, and we want to have an earthly king. To Samuel and to God, they were saying, we want to be like them. Today, we as the body of Christ, we need to be careful. Because if we're not careful, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not careful, we'll go after worldly pursuits and we'll want to look like everybody else. We want to have an asterisk beside our name and say, we're a Christian, but we really fit in with everybody else, but we're a Christian. That's really, we don't want to be set apart. It's not like we want to just have it as a side note. I can do what everybody else does, but hey, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven. I'm telling you, God looks at it very differently. Today, we're tempted into thinking that in order to try to win lost people, that we need to blend in with them. In order to win lost people, we need to do what lost people do and blend in with lost people. Wrong answer. Wrong answer. Many a lost person have died and went to hell looking at Christians trying to blend in and look like them, and they have concluded to themselves and themselves that, you know what, there's nothing different between that Christian and me, so why in the world should I put my trust in their God? We're to look radically different than this world. Amen? We are. That's getting lost today in our so-called Christian culture that you and I say that we're in. That's getting lost. It's being set aside. Um, 
We want to do whatever we want to do. We want to be like everybody else. Churches want to be like other organizations. Sometimes churches want to just be about everything else instead of really what they're supposed to be about. Christians want to be about everything else instead of what they're supposed to be about. I look at some examples that I have in my own life. Listen, as a pastor, I've been a pastor for 23 years. Every now and then, every now and then I'm in an association meeting or I'm in some type of state meeting, Tennessee Baptist Convention meeting or Southern Baptist Convention meeting, and inevitably somebody will go to a microphone and say, we're, we're to operate like a business. This is a business. We're handling millions of dollars. You know, we should, we've got to have a business mindset. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're a ministry. We're not a business. Amen? Years ago, Lifeway was the Baptist Sunday School Board. It was managed and ran by pastors, men of God, or people that had been in Christian service for years, were selected and brought in to be the leaders because it was a ministry. It was a ministry that ministered to churches, and it helped resource Southern Baptist churches. I've been a pastor since 2000, and it was already changed the Lifeway by that time. And listen, all that I've ever seen in 23 years is Lifeway does some good. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but I'm telling you this. It operates like a business, and it's a ministry. It's a ministry. I've heard it sometimes in business meetings in churches or in leadership meetings in 23 years at different places at different times. Well, Brother Jason, that's ministry, but this over here, we got to handle that like a business. No, everything we touch needs to be handled like a ministry. Amen? We're not a business. We're not a business. I agree we have to uh, agree with some tax codes and different things. I understand that, but we are never, ever to be a business. We're not to be like every other business down the street because we're not a business. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His bride. We are endued with His power. And we're to operate the way He says, according to His book. And we are not going to be like everybody else. Amen? We're just not. And I know that's not popular today, but we're not. Uh, listen, churches have bought into this. They try to draw a crowd with all kinds of bells and whistles and giveaways. And what? What are we doing? What are, we, what are we raffling? What are we doing? Churches do this. I'm like, what are we doing trying to draw people with bells and whistles? Uh, listen, uh, we, listen, Brother Jason, well, there's certain people that think we should pray over our pets and have a day where we dedicate our pets. No, we're not doing that. I mean, who's doing that? We give in to every whim of everybody. No, no, we're not doing that. For the person that wanted to do that, see me after church, we'll talk. But no, I'm not bringing Hank over here. If Hank comes over, me and Kevin were talking about this today. If Hank comes in this sanctuary, somebody, listen, the guy's out front, let him in, amen. So he's, well, we're not praying over Hank and dedicating Hank to the Lord. Churches do all kinds of things like that because they want to be appealing to society. They want to be like everybody else. I'm going to vent a little bit this morning. I hope you can take this. I just Sometimes I get tired of it. There's pastors that choose sermon titles and series titles after nasty Netflix movies and series to try to draw. It's interesting. It's controversial. And they try to draw people in. They, they share the same title as some movie that's ungodly. And they want to twist on it when people come in. What, are you trying to bait and switch people with that? What are... What are we doing in the body of Christ that we want to be like everybody else? Here it is, the people of God here. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, they come to Samuel. They don't want to be like the people of God. They, they don't want to follow after Samuel, the judge, or anybody else that God would raise up. They, know, they say, hey, no, we want an earthly king. We don't want to follow after the person God puts in place. We don't want to follow after God who's in heaven. He's invisible. We want an earthly king like everybody else. That's exactly what they were saying. They long for an earthly king. They wanted to be like everybody else. Number two in this sermon, God gave them what they think they wanted. Look at chapter 8 and look down at verse number 22. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. There was a, verse, chapter 9, verse 1, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, 
the son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now, here we have um, Saul is introduced into our text. Uh, Saul is tall, dark, and handsome, if you will. I mean, he looked the part. And listen, that's what the people were interested in. They wanted someone that would look the part. I'm kind of thinking our country might be the same, amen. Sometimes we just want someone that looks the part. Let me tell you something. I, I played a little golf on Friday, just a little bit. Listen, Jamie, I can look the part. You know what I mean? If Jamie was to pull up and, and see me and say, well, Jason looks like a golfer. He's got a golf bag. He's wearing the right ball cap, and he's got golf shoes. I mean, he kind of looks the part. And, and put me in a golf cart, someone would say, he looks like a really good golfer. Let me tell you something. I, I'm not a good golfer, amen. I'm just not a good golfer. I might can look the part. But listen, we're caught up with people looking the parts, what we're wanting them to do. Well, here it is. Saul, he looks the part. He's tall, dark, and handsome. I mean, he looks good. He looks the part. He fits the bill here. Um, even though God's ordered line, should there be someone come from a line that's actually going to rule and reign over the people, it's going to be someone from the tribe of Judah, not Benjamin. Not Benjamin. It's going to be someone from the tribe of Judah. Now, remember that. Um, if we were to read further, on into chapter 9, we find that Saul's father had some donkeys that had strayed away. Uh, Saul and one of his father's servants, they go out looking for the donkeys, and they can't find the donkeys, and they're going out, and they're trying to find them. And Saul says, we better go back, uh, else our father, my father is going to be more concerned about us than the donkeys if we don't get back. Then the servant says to um, Saul, he says, hey, listen, no, let's don't go back. Let's go into the city. Let's go on over to this city. I hear there's a seer there. There's a man of God. We'll go see him, and he'll tell us where these donkeys are, and we'll go get them and bring them back home because this guy, whatever this guy says, it absolutely comes true. He's talking about Samuel, talking about Samuel. So they head into the city, Saul does, and one of his dad's servants, and they're going to run into Samuel, the prophet. Look at chapter 9, verse number 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you? And on all your father's house. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? In the margin of my Bible, um, I have written here from whenever I've read the Bible through before a few times, it says that God even orchestrated donkeys becoming lost in order for Saul to meet Samuel. And that's true. God allows all of this. God is going to give them what they think they wanted. God orchestrates these events. And what Samuel here is saying to Saul is that he's saying to him, he says, listen, you're going to become king, is what he's saying to Saul. Now, Saul knows that a king should actually come from the tribe of Judah, not Benjamin. He understands that. But this is who God has pointed out. God says, this is who you're going to anoint. And on top of that, Saul says, uh, Saul says back to Samuel, listen, my tribe, listen, we're a Benjamin. We shouldn't be doing this. And not only that, my family's the least of all the tribes of Benjamin. I'm like, I'm the lowest man. I'm the last person you should probably come for. So Saul really wasn't looking to do this at all. He did not want to serve in this capacity at all. Understand, he didn't want to do it. But now the people, they 
wanted a certain type of man, a certain type of leader. Remember how the elders said they wanted a king like the other nations. Well, God was going to give them what they thought that they wanted. Let me give you a little commercial here for your prayer life and mine. It's a dangerous way to pray. Is when you and I start praying and start asking God to give us what we think we want instead of what we know, what his word says. You ever find yourself praying about something and if you really start looking at the word of God, you're like, this makes no sense that God would actually answer this prayer in the affirmative. But we got to be careful. Come, sometimes you and I can keep praying and being persistent with God and he might just give us what we think we want. Let me tell you something. Not a single one of us want that. We don't. We may think we do, but I assure you, we don't want that at all. We, we need to have a desire for whatever God wants in our lives. And if you don't pray like this, maybe you should pray like this. And I pray this. I'm like, Lord, this is something I think that would be helpful. Lord, this is something I think could be needed. But, Lord, if it's not your will, I don't want it. I don't want to step into it. Don't let it come to me at all. Help me not engage with that. Lord, if this is something you want, then help me walk into it. Lord, if my thoughts are just out in left field, then God, help, the, help my thoughts fall to the ground. But God, if this is something that perhaps I am on to what you want me to do, then God, help open the door for that to happen. But if you don't want it, I don't want it. That has got to be our prayer. The last thing you and I want is God to give us something that we think we need instead of him giving us what we really need from him. Well, the people told God that they didn't want him as their heavenly king, that they wanted an earthly king. And so God here has given them what they thought they wanted. Look a little further, 1 Samuel chapter 10. I told you there's a lot of verses. We're going to keep going. Look at verse number 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. And now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Stop right there. All right, Samuel is saying all of this to Saul. And he's saying, listen, you're going to go. You're going to run into these people. They're going to be carrying these things. Then you're going to come in to run into these other people, and they're going to be carrying these things. And let me tell you something. While we have free will, and we understand that, God also can make something happen, and you and I have nothing to do with it at all, and we're just, in, we're just part of it. It's amazing right here how God orchestrated all of this, allowed all this to come to pass. He says through Samuel, this is what's going to happen. And then, listen, God no doubt instructs and speaks through Samuel. And then God makes all of this happen. And I come to a conclusion that I do almost in every sermon I ever preach. Why in the world do you and I worry about anything when we can just simply trust God? It's for me too. Why in the world would we second guess him and wonder? When God can bring about whatever he wants to bring about, our Position really should be, God, help me have my motive right with you. That I'll be in submission to you, and I will do whatever you want me to do. And you can use me to do whatever you want, God, and I want to line up and say yes to you at the same time. I, I, I'm willing to be part of whatever you want me to do, even when I'm unaware of it. I mean, it's amazing what God does here. And all this is happening. And then he says, you're going to run to these people prophesying. Verse number 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will you. And you will prophesy with them and be turned into and 6,000 horsemen and people, in the, uh, people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. Stop right there. Did you hear how many people the Philistines had? Saul turned back people that wanted to fight. He turned back people when the Philistines outnumbered them greatly. He didn't know what he was doing. Verse 6. 
When the men of Israel saw what they, that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. Stop right there. Remember Samuel saying that I would come to you at such and such time? I'll come to you. Wait for me. I will offer these sacrifices is what he says. Well, verse 8. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That's a mouthful. That's a lot. Saul disregarded. The command of the Lord is what he did. Um, Saul's not a priest. Not a priest. Not a priest. Saul is king, not a priest. And what we're talking about here, they're taking before them the ark of God. We're talking about men that would carry on poles the ark of God. We're talking about the, the golden box that, that had inside of it the Ten Commandments. Listen, God's presence went with the ark. And so here we have Saul offering up burnt offerings and sacrifices to God. He's not a priest. He's not part of the priesthood at all. And here it is. We find that Saul tries to give an excuse. And he's like, well, Samuel, you didn't come when you said you was going to come. And he took matters into his own hands. And listen, he did whatever he thought was best. He broke God's word and God's command concerning the offerings and the sacrifices. And he thought, well, you know what? In this situation, I can do what I think is best. Mark it down. Don't you ever, 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 and I should never, ever, ever compromise God's word because we feel compelled by somebody else to make something happen right now. Make sure that you don't compromise God's word by letting the pressure of this world or other people trying to say that you need to do this or you need to do that. Listen, when anyone comes to me with some urgency that I've got to do something, I usually stop really quick and say, I don't either. There's been times with benevolence. Listen, we get involved with some benevolence cases, absolutely. But if I get a call tomorrow and someone calls me at 3 o'clock and they say that, that, that they need my help and I've got to do it by 4 o'clock or it's not going to happen and they're going to be in trouble, I'll tell them right then, I can't make that happen that fast. Usually when people are trying to pressure you to do something right now, it's got to happen right now, oftentimes you will compromise what you know to be best. You'll compromise even perhaps God's word. Well, here it is. We've got Saul compromising God's word. He's compromising it. And he absolutely commits a sin here. He lets the fear of the Philistines breathing down his neck. He lets that, listen, he lets that motivate him to do something that he should never do. He did the unthinkable. Listen, nobody else in the people of God would dare do what Saul just did. But Saul thought because he was king, he could do whatever it is that he wanted to do. And God said, no, you can't. And Samuel said, no, you can't. And King Saul could say, well, I've done some good. I've done some good things over here. Let me tell you something. You and I could have a track record with the Lord where we do a lot of things right and a lot of things good. It will never, ever, ever give us the excuse to get over here and compromise God's word and walk straight into sin and think you and I are above it. Agreed? I don't know who's getting this today, but I know I'm getting it. I just know that there, we get to a place sometimes where we think that, that we're above it or we can overcome it or we need to do whatever we want to do. God's word is our authority. 
And the sooner the body of Christ as a whole across all planet of earth will gather together and understand that the word of God has got to be our authority, the better off we'll be. But we compromise often. We make adjustments and we compromise God's word. If we were to fast forward in the next few chapters, we find that Saul continues on his path of disregarding God's word. In, in chapter 15, for instance, um, in chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, he is supposed to kill these foreign kings, their warriors, all the plunder, all their livestock. Don't keep any of it. Kill it all. Wipe it all out. In chapter 15, King Saul lets King Agag of the Amalekites live. Then he takes some of the best of his livestock and says, hey, well, we'll take some of this. Totally against God's word. Totally against God's word. And that's the thing is, once someone starts compromising what God says, then listen, they'll just start compromising everything that God says. Flip over to chapter 15. Verse 10 and 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. Sad. Sad state of affairs. All that plunder should have been destroyed. King Agag should have never lived. Should have never lived. Look at chapter 15 verse 22 and 23. So Samuel said, has the, Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Let me tell you something. Brother Jason, if I go against what I know God's word says, is it a big deal? It's rebellion. If I go against what God clear, God's word clearly says this or that, and I go the opposite way of it, are you telling me it's that bad? Here it is. The word of God says it's as bad as witchcraft. Listen, I know it's 2023. Listen, there's a percentage of the body of Christ that don't even know that witchcraft's bad. Can I get a witness? Where have we been? We got our heads up under a rock somewhere. Witchcraft is idolatry, rebellion, abomination. We play around with it sometimes. It's horrible. Kids' movies, I won't go to Harry Potter, but you know where I like to go with that. Let me tell you something. We've got our heads in the sand thinking nothing's wrong with any of that stuff. And here it is we find that he says any type of rebellion or stubbornness. I don't know of any of us that's not been stubborn. We've all been a little stubborn with God, I imagine, but he takes it serious. Sin is serious business. And let me, let me tell you, this may be why we've got some preachers that won't even preach out of the Old Testament hardly at all because back here in the Old Testament we find out that, that yes, God loves us, but we also find that, the, that God's a God of justice. And we find that God has order. Today that's out of vogue to say that God actually has an order of things, but he does. He absolutely does. If you look over in chapter 15 at verse 33, but Samuel said, as you're, at least he's talking to Agag, the king. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Horrible. I thank God for Samuel. Saul was a failure, an absolute failure. His great sin, he just kept compromising God's word. He kept ignoring God's command. He kept doing whatever it is that he thought he should do. Listen, Saul was 40 years old when he starts to rule. 40. 40 years old when he starts to rule. He started off tall, dark, and handsome, but by the end of this, listen, he is thin-skinned. He is angry. Uh, he's hot-tempered. He's given over to seasons of depression. He even considers murder at times, and he <laughs> certainly went after David, and that's a future sermon there, but he was the people's choice. They wanted a king just like everybody else, and everybody else, based on what I can see here, Everybody else had a wicked king, and God gave them a wicked king. 
David was born about 10 years after Saul became king, if you're wondering about the timeline. So Saul's king around the time he's being king, anointed king, David was born. David was the one that Samuel was speaking of years before. David, who was talking about Samuel, or, or Samuel was talking about David and talking about the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. God was looking toward David for a while. He was going to raise somebody up that would honor him and that would walk in his commands and would walk in the ways. He wasn't perfect. We know that, and we're going to hear that in this series. What are some of the takeaways today? I know I've mentioned a few already, but let's, let's kind of get a few takeaways before we walk out the door. We'll put these on the screen. So, First one, make sure you stay in God's Word so that you can know what God wants. It's pretty simple. How are we going to know what God wants if we don't get in His Word? It's enough for you and I to get in His Word regularly, amen? Um, it just is. In doing so, we'll be able to distinguish the difference between what God wants and what we want. Today, hey, Christian, let me talk to you and me for just a minute. Let me tell you. You and I think we want things for our lives. We better check and find out what God wants for our lives. We better find out what he wants. Because what you want, if you're a born-again Christian, what you want has got to take a back seat to what he wants. And if you push the envelope with him and you want to be who you want to be to the point where you want to rebel against him, he may allow you and I to rebel against him and be whatever it is we want to be. And next thing you know, we won't find God if we're in a broom closet with him. And we'll wonder where he is because we have rebelled against our God and he may allow all kinds of judgment to fall down upon us in this life. We could still be saved in eternity, yes, but live a lost life down here. If we want to know what God wants, we've got to get in God's word. Amen? Another thing, follow the Lord's commands. <sighs> even if you don't understand everything, even if you don't understand why God would do what he did, still follow his command. Even if we don't know why, you know, why God would do this or say this and why is this so, listen, it may take you and I five or ten years of Christian maturity to understand what God's word is meaning in a certain place in the Bible. But until you and I understand it, we've got to just, we've got to trust God and walk in his word. It's like a child. Listen, parents, you get children, you've got children, you have to give them rules sometimes. If you stop and, you can't stop and give them a 30-minute answer about why you have every rule. I mean, you could tell a kid, hey, listen, don't run out on the road. You know what I mean? I mean, like every time that you have to yell that, you don't want to say, let me tell you why I don't run out on the road and you give him a 30 minute sermon on that. No, no, listen, there's times a kid's going to have to respond, stop, don't run out on the road. You know what I mean? And then they come over and you spend some time and it takes a little time for that kid to realize that's dangerous. I can't do that. Listen, as a Christian, there's times that God is saying, don't do something. And if you and I are waiting around till we completely understand why he said it, we'll wind up walking right into that sin. We're like, well, I didn't know it was that bad. Well, I didn't know why God said not do it. Well, listen, if he said don't do it, we need to not do it. If God's word says this is the way it is, it is the way it is. Two weeks from now, um, I will be at the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, it will be in New Orleans. And I'll be there representing our church. Um, two years ago, our denomination voted our, the, through the Credentials Committee disfellowship with Rick Warren's church called Saddleback Church out in California. They had ordained three women as pastors, named them pastors. And more recently, in the last two years, in Rick Warren's retirement, he's pastor emeritus, he handpicked a husband and wife team that will be pastors, plural. She's a pastor and he's a pastor of Saddleback Church. Our credentials committee at the, at the Southern Baptist Convention said to them, that's not biblical. It's outside of the Baptist faith of the message 2000. And it, listen, and if anyone's going to part ways with what Scripture says in 1 Timothy and also in Titus, clearly stating that, that uh, the pastor is a husband of one wife, listen, what else are they going to compromise on? Well, this year, in two weeks, they're appealing that, and that's going to come back to the floor, and we're going to have a big talk among ten or 12,000 people about this again when we've already ruled on it. 
And whatever Rick Warren's done, it's been good. He's done a lot of good. Remember I said a lot, you can do a lot of good over here? He's done a lot of good. That man's taught me a lot over the years. But nobody gets to a place where you can stand over and say, I've done all this. This is what he said two years ago, and Mike Pinnegrove was with me when he said it. He said, I've done all this good so we can ordain women if we want to be pastors. And the convention floor said, no, you can't. Scripturally, you can't. Now, you can do whatever you want as a church, but you won't be part of what we're doing because you're going to compromise other things even, you know, even down the line. That's coming back up. And I've said all that to say this. You'll see the press. The press, by the way, rarely ever reports anything positive that we do as Southern Baptists or any denomination for that matter. You'll hear all of this stuff and wonder where we stand. I'll give a report about everything that we did at the convention, but I just want you to understand this, that we Southern Baptists that are conservative-minded with this Bible aren't trying to be hard and difficult. What we're saying is this. None of us are above God's word that we can tell God's word what it should be. Now listen, women play a, an amazing role in the body of Christ. Amazing. And for whatever reason, God's plan of how he lays out church leadership is that, that a man's going to be the pastor of a church. That's just what, and listen, I, you can ask God when we get to heaven, why is that? I Listen, I don't understand all the whys. We know that he's also a man's going to be the head of the house. We know that. Many people have problems with that. Listen, I don't understand everything why God said that, but guess what? That's part of his order. We've got to accept his order, even when we don't understand everything about it. And that goes with gender assignment, race assignment, all that. Listen, God's in charge of things that we're not. And, and here it is, what we have here in our scripture is Saul thought he could do whatever he wanted to do. And the people of God wanted whatever they thought they wanted. And they had drifted from what God's word says, and they began to do whatever they wanted, and they had whatever it is they wanted, which was failure and problems and destruction. Takeaways. Stay in God's word so you'll know what God wants. I know you want things, and I want things sometimes. Guess what? There's times it doesn't line up with God's word, what we want. Submit to God's word and submit to him. I assure you, in time... You'll sense his love in all of it more than just him saying no. Follow God's word even if you don't understand everything. Absolutely. And, and last but certainly not least, God is able to save us and deliver us from the attacks of the enemy. We've got to keep trusting God. Saul quit trusting God in this and he started taking matters into his own hands. He stopped trusting that God was going to save the day. He's right there with the ark of God. Yet he just trusted that, you know, or thought to himself, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to go so good. He began to hit the panic button, and he failed to trust God. Now, listen, the going does get tough in this life. But you've got to keep trusting God. You've got to keep believing that God can deliver you. Don't believe in yourself that you can deliver yourself. You and I, we're not that strong. But he is. He is. Saul, I, I feel for Saul in some ways. I'll tell you, Brother Jason, do you think Saul knew the Lord? I, I think Saul knew the Lord. Do you think, uh, what do you think about his situation there? God changed his heart. He actually become exactly what they wanted. It's one of those things, kind of like Judas Iscariot. You know what I mean? Judas Iscariot's the son of perdition. I, I got my feelings about where he is, and that's sad, but... But let me tell you something. Scripture talked like somebody was going to reject Jesus and sell him out. That's what Judas Iscariot did. So every now and then what you find in Scripture is that what God prophesies and what he says is going to happen, he's going to make that happen. And in your life and mine, there's a ton of decisions day in and day out where it's not like a prophetic thing hanging over your head. And you're not automatically going to do whatever it is God's word says you should do. You and I have got a lot of choices to make in this life. And he's given you and I his word to help make those choices. Just don't try to change the word. As Southern Baptists, that's what we're going to be saying on, in two weeks. The word of God's not changed. And listen, we're not caving into that. And by the way, a few churches, a few in number, whatever they report, it's not thousands and thousands, it's few in number compared to 50,000 Southern Baptist churches out there. So don't let the headlines go wrong. But know this, we're going to try to stand on God's word. 
And somebody said, well, I just hope there's a whole bunch of unity at that meeting. We could, we could be united going the wrong direction, so I'm not sure if that's my prayer exactly. My prayer is that God's will will prevail. That's my prayer. Not just in that one piece of business, but others. Others. And by the way, me and the deacons are one on this, I believe. That we also believe that Southern Baptist Convention, if there was a way that we could do missions better, we love the cooperative program. We thank God for being part of a network of churches. We're autonomous. Certainly, we operate on our own, certainly. But we choose to cooperate in missions because we believe it's the best way to do missions, and it is by far. But in this process, there's a few things that do need to get worked on. Not everything, but there's a few things. And my heart is, is that, you know what? We're going to fight to make those things the best they can be to honor God. So we lay in there with this. We don't run away and say, oh, I don't like one thing they're doing. No, we'll stand and say, we've got to fight for what is right. And stand there to say, we want the word of God to be lifted up. In your life, stand for the word of God. Amen? Stand on the word of God. Don't compromise. Be lovingly firm. Amen? And share the word of God with people. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We see such a bad example here in Saul. We see a good example in Samuel. We see our ultimate example in you, Lord. Lord, help us follow your word. Help us not compromise your word. Help us recognize that we don't need to be like everybody else. We need to be who you want us to be. Not even who we want to be. We need to be who you want us to be. Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand. Go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to...